I'm John Travis in Mullumbimby, New South Wales, where it is the 24th of, November, of March on, uh, in 2021, talking to Dawson Church in Petaluma, California, where it's still only the 23rd of March. And uh, we've known each other, what, 15, 20 years, uh, haven't been connected for a while, and we're just reconnecting. I'm tracking down a lot of old friends for this project. And I want to get into who you are and why and uh, where you were born, all of these early influences that led you into your present path. So let's start at the beginning. Well, I now work as primarily an educator and researcher. And so I have a company that trains people mostly practitioners, mostly therapists and life coaches and advanced risk reduction techniques. I also have a nonprofit that does research and also gets PTSD treatments to veterans who have PTSD. So I have these two facets of what I do right now, one the business of training, one the nonprofit of service. And they really grew out of my own discoveries and my own life journey. And it began for me really early in life when um, I, I noticed the gap between people's public and private behavior. My father was a, a missionary. A lot of our um, associates were missionaries. My uncle was a, a really well-known uh, Episcopal priest in Africa. And so we were traveling, we were meeting a lot of other clergy, other clergy would stay at our, our homes. And I was really struck by how I'd hear this minister preaching this inspiring sermon from the pulpit on Sunday morning, and everyone in the church was really just, in, just transported to a different place of inspiration by what this man had said. <clears throat> and then Monday morning, I noticed him kicking his cat and abusing his wife. <laughs> mm. <laughs> the difference between private and public behavior. And so what is the mm -hmm. difference between, I actually teach an ethics course now, and I say, what do you do with the doors closed that you wouldn't want a TV screen broadcasting to the whole world? And so seeing all this abuse, uh, seeing all the um, utter hypocrisy of that world, just as a kid left me an atheist at the age of five. I mean, I was five years old. I thought, there's no God, there's no, no truth to all this religious nonsense. I was also very, very, very wounded personally. I, I, there was a lot of turmoil in the, fa in the family. And I now know when I look back, I, I have PTSD. I, I was having flashbacks and nightmares. I was suicidal by the time I was you know, 12, 13. I didn't want, didn't want to be here. And then um, I had an experience at that point of one day just in my bedroom, totally depressed, totally anxious. I mean, People talk during the pandemic about social distancing, stand six feet apart, two meters apart from each other. Well, when I was 12, people stood two meters apart or more from me because I was so depressing. I was so toxically, tragically depressed and anxious no one wanted to be with me. And so in the, in the middle of this misery, no friends, um, no, no sense of wanting to even be on the planet. I one day just had this experience sitting in my bedroom that the universe was love. I just suddenly was, in this space where I was seeing the universe, it was love, I was love, and there was nothing else but love. And it, it certainly didn't, it wasn't an, an experience I could operationalize or relate to anyone. I couldn't even tell anyone about it. In fact, one giant study by my friend, Andrew Newberg, who wrote the book, How Enlightenment Changes Your Brain, says that people are having these, he calls them small E enlightenment experiences. They're not some sort of big magical enlightenment after which you're a different person, but they're mm -hmm. an insight. They're an insight into the nature of the cosmos, the possibility of transcendent reality. And he said, people are having these and they hardly ever tell even their husband or wife or friend, best friend or, or neighbor or parent or child. They just mm -hmm. don't talk about them. And so children have these. Children have when they're, when they're, when they're three, five, nine, 12. A lot of teenagers have them and we don't talk about them. But I also went to go and live on a spiritual community then at that point. So from 15 onwards till roughly 30, I was uh, living in spiritual communities and uh, also seeing some of the same patterns of abuse and, and neglect mm. and, and hypocrisy I'd seen in the church. And I also though learned meditation, learned spiritual healing, learned what Aldous Huxley called, or Alan Watts, I forget which of the two it was, uh, called the perennial philosophy. That, that, that grand 
idea that underlies all religions. And then I, I at least learned a lot of that stuff theoretically. I didn't see much of it in practice, but I, I, and I then then knew there was this, this grand philosophy. And then after a whole lot more suffering, I uh, eventually got into psychology, learned about that, became a publisher, a book publisher, and uh, never thought of myself as having anything to say. I was the guy who published other people's books. But then uh, after working with Bruce Lipton on his huge mega bestseller, The, the Biology of Belief, I began to think, well, where do we go next after Bruce's idea? So I wrote the book, The Genie in Your Genes. And I had this just really once in a lifetime flash where I put all these pieces together. And in 2005, the book came out and I claimed then there was no direct evidence for this then whatsoever. I mean, there was lots of circumstantial evidence, but no direct experimental evidence. But I claimed that spiritual experiences, meditation, transcendent experiences, uh, energy healing was turning genes on and off. And that was a big claim to make back then. And I was doing it inferentially. And there was certainly, exper- there was certainly evidence showing that these things were turning hormones on and off and enzymes being turned on and off. So we, we knew that cortisol and DHEA and other, other hormones were rising and falling based on mental states. But I then said, well, it's obvious that if, 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 if that mental state, that positive mental attitude is creating a decrease in cortisol, it must be down-regulating the gene that codes for cortisol. And if that we know that positive mental states are down regulating cortisol and up regulating regulating DHEA, we know it must be turning on the gene that is the final uh, link in the chain to DHEA. So I wrote this book, The Gene in Your Genes. It did really well. I focused a lot on getting the word out there and suddenly I had a new career. I was speaking. I found that people responded when I spoke and I began to really get deep into the science of transformation. And then I founded EFT Universe, which teaches EFT, which is acupressure, tapping on acupressure points to release stress. I began to do education in that that field. And I also had uh, an insight at a conference in 2007 about all of these techniques. And I was with all these wonderful keynote speakers. We were saying, you know, heart math is so effective at calming the mm-hmm. the sympathetic nervous system and we know that we know that tapping works pretty well we know now it lowers cortisol we know that mindfulness is good and we know that neuro, there's neurofeedback techniques that really are shifting you into parasympathetic nervous system relaxation mode and i thought that i had this big bright idea imagine if like you know if you're a kid at a candy store and and you know or an ice cream store and you see well there's pop fudge and there's Rocky Road and there's pecan, praline, and Neapolitan. You you like all these flavors. Imagine a big ice cream where we stack them all together. So I developed a little routine to stack heart math on top of EFT, on top of mindfulness, on top of neurofeedback, on top of self-hypnosis and affirmations. And then I was at a conference, so I got 200 people to do it together. And everyone in the room went into heart coherence together. And then people came up to me and said afterwards, Dawson, I've never been able to meditate before. And I had a profound experience then. So I put it up free on the web, didn't think much about it, left it there. I call, I call it eco meditation. Sat there for a few years. My webmaster came to me around 2015 and said, do you know the organic traffic to ecomeditation.com is more than 10,000 visitors a month? I'm like, whoa, we better, for one thing, create a, a decent looking web page, and for another thing, do some research. So we did some research, we did some um, pen and paper questionnaire, psychological research showed that it was having big effects on, on, the, on people's experience. We then did some EEG research, we sh- showed the EEG researcher who was leading this, this research project after the first morning of assessing people, I had lunch with her. And I was very interested to hear what, what was going on with people when you were, when you were looking at their EEG readouts and she was almost beside herself with excitement. She said, we've never seen brain scans like this outside of Tibetan masters. These are, the, these are we're, it likes, it's like we're looking at the brain function of a 10,000 hour master meditator. And these are people who, who are meditating for the first time in their lives. So I realized mm-hmm. that this combination was really potent. I began to <clears throat> now an MRI study and I'm not really focusing on letting people know that they can be 
much happier, much healthier than they were before through techniques like these energy techniques. So that's kind of 65 years <laughs> mm. <laughs> of story. Wow. Well, I, I just want to go back to the very beginning for a few more details. Like, did you grow up in Africa or as a missionary's child? What was, uh, what was your exposure, earliest exposure? Uh, well, uh, my, my parents are, uh, my, my whole family's from England, but um, a bunch of them moved to South Africa in 1820. Uh, some others moved back to England, then they moved to Utah, they, to uh, New York, then to Utah, they were Mormons. Um, uh -huh. They've been gypsies. They, one, one, my grandfather went to Ghana and West Africa and was gold miner there, um, then went back to England. So when I was, I was born in, in, in South Africa, but we went to live in Lesotho for a while. We then went back to England when I was four. We lived in America for, for a few years, back to South Africa. So oh, it was just all so over. So you were all over the place. Yeah. And any siblings? Yeah, one, one sister. Older, younger? Younger, and I'm still very, very, very close to her. And so it's uh -huh. wonderful to have family and yeah. feel connected. And your mother, what, was, what kind of influence did she have on your development? Heaven and hell. Uh, my mother died when I was 40 and I had 20 years of hell and I had 20, then 20 years of heaven. And she had uh, some kind of experience. I, I don't know fully when I was 20 years old. I wasn't there. I was at, way at college, but I came back and mom had left the room and someone else was in her body. Uh, she was also depressed, anxious, miserable. Her father was horribly abusive. And I, there's only one photograph I have of my mom when she was maybe seven and her face is as a mask of misery. And so she grew up uh, being abused and became an abusive mom and was you know, doing the best she could. But the biblical term, the biblical, biblical excuse is to spare the rod is to spoil a child. So you basically wow. beat the crap out of your kid at every possible opportunity for every imagined Misty, and I didn't even know what I was being whacked for half the time. I just knew I was getting whacked a lot. And uh, so that was the first, that was 20 years worth of it. And then something happened when she was, I don't know what happened at that age of her life. Was, I think she was 20, she was 45 at the time. Uh, but I came back from college one day and there was this loving, sweet human being in my mom's body. <laughs> so I had 20 years wow. of closeness with my mom. And yeah. she never could describe what happened or you didn't find out? No, I don't know what happened. Huh. And did you wonder whether, whether it was gonna last at first? Yeah, I was pretty suspicious of it at first. Yeah. And so we became very, very close for the last, uh, those last 20 years. Interesting. Uh, in terms of your schooling, then you probably were in a lot of different schools and different countries and Yep. Uh, how, how was that for you? Were you uh, uh, a nerd, a jock, a, you know, average kid? Uh, what what to school like? I was an abject failure. Um, I, uh, I, I'm really good with, with English because I pretty much failed at everything else. They said, well, what we do with, with, this, with this dummy church, let's stick them in English class. So uh, I just was tanked at everything else. I mean, in, in math, okay, now I wanted to tell you right now, I have every day in my inbox, I'm being bombarded with, with requests to be a peer reviewer for medical journals, okay? That's today. And I edit a, a psychology journal myself and I'm, I'm a peer reviewer. I've been, have played a role in over hundred clinical trials. Um, when I was uh, 12, 13 in, in high school, my high school teacher, um, ranked her kids by math aptitude. So now I read statistical tables and I'll, I'll criticize the work of statisticians, that's today. Back then, uh, Miss K was her name. I know she's been dead for many years. So I don't think she cares. Uh -huh. And you put the, the, the kids who were good at math in the front of the class. So the front row was all the kids that were worth teaching. Uh, in the back of the class were the ones that were not worth teaching, had no interest in math and were terrible at math. And, and, all, and all the rest were in the middle rows of the class. Guess where I was in the class? I'm guessing the back. 
Well, close. Uh, she had a special role behind the bathroom. And there was one boy, and I, I, I hope I find him one day. His name was, was John, J-E-A-N, John Barnard. And uh, John and I were accorded the dubious distinction of being behind the back row, uh, just not even worth seating in the back row. So that, that was back then, you know. So, so I grew up believing I was bad at math. And so, we, you know, we, that's the human potential movement because mm -hmm. we, we get these, Miss K, bless her heart, believe I was bad at math. I believe I was bad at math. Um, I had reinforcing experiences to do that. Now, I'm not brilliant at math, but I'm pretty darn good. I mean, I make a money every year in the stock market and by you know noticing patterns and I, um, I peer review for journals. I read statistical tables. I can interpret results. I can read a table with you know hundreds of values and pick out the relevant ones. So in, in so many ways we're, we're, being, we're told, oh, you know, you have no sense of direction. Um, mm -hmm. you'll never make a good musician. And these th things we acquire as kids are mostly the limited thinking of the adults around us. They are lies and we live them our whole lives unless we break out and become something more. Wow. And then uh, where did you go to college? I went to university, first of all, at Baylor University, which is a Baptist college in Texas, because my father, we had no money. I mean, growing up, we were just incredibly poor. And so um, I got a scholarship because it was a, a Baptist university when my father had, had people he knew. I went there. I was in Texas for two uh, pretty miserable years and then um, graduated really quickly so I could escape. Oh, there, there suddenly at, at Baylor, I suddenly discovered I was I was really brilliant. So I went through the four years of college in two years. I just, I discovered you could, you could test out of things. And um, that just means you walk into the exam room and there's, I don't know if this still exists in the US universities, but back then you could just go take the final exam for history without going to a single class. And if you passed, you got credit for that. So I, when I discovered that after about two years, I just went and sat in every, every final exam, passed them all immediately and then graduated and also I was the first student to they have a, a prestigious uh, program called the University Scholars Program and they'd had numerous people in the program over the years and no one could ever finish because it was rigorous and um, I became the first person to graduate through the University Scholars Program the very very first person at Baylor to ever do that so I suddenly realized I'm, I'm not a dummy <laughs> What a turnaround, yeah. <laughs> and how, how did that awareness, was it sudden or gradual? Or uh, that's quite a, a huge turnaround. Yeah, I, I just realized I could, I could do this. And uh, I was much smarter than my professors. And I just began to you know, take advantage of that and to, mm. to get out and get, get through. And then I also went to, I, I, I circled back when I was uh, like 30 years later because I needed to have some kind of degree when I was publishing my first book. The gene in your genes. So I went to Holos University, which Norm Sheely right. uh, just mm -hmm. uh, was founding then, and I got a, a degree there. And so I just finished. I bring bought a bunch of old credits I had, and very very quickly got that degree. So that just gave me, you know, a, a, a graduate degree to to stick on the books, uh -huh. so I could have that level. Now I'm curious geographically uh, how you wound up in California, where it's where you were when I met you, but uh, you were in Texas for college, and then then where from what? what uh, probably a lot of years between then and and uh, being in California. What? Yeah, uh, ten years in New York. So uh, Texas to New York, ten years, and there New York City or uh, New York City, uh, this, Manhattan. Yeah, uh -huh. this is during the recession of the nineteen like like seventy nine and. Uh, so jobs were hard to come by. I had I graduated near the top of my class. I had a lot of uh, work experience and um, I'd done some internships. And so I was really well qualified. And I spent several years trying to get a job in broadcasting, which is what my degree was in. Mm. Couldn't get a job. And so I wound up just working as a kind of a handyman for many, many years and doing editing as well. I did book editing and you know, odd, odd jobs to survive. 
but um, spent you know, roughly 10 years doing that, hating it, feeling terrible about myself and about the world, and again, being pretty miserable and depressed uh, along, along the way. And then I, I met a woman, we got married, and we we're going to have a child. And she was from California, and I decided that California was a much nicer place to have a child than New York, because you can park a car, uh-huh. and there aren't crazy people running through the streets um, accosting you in the doorway of your, or urinating in, the, in your doorway. So I uh, decided to, we, we, we moved to California, no, uh, instead, never, never, never left. Where, where did, was that? What part of California? Santa Cruz, Santa Cruz County. Oh, okay. That's a, a, a real <laughs> shock from New York City, I'll bet. Yeah. Counterculture. So, yeah. And I, I'm thinking the process of I'm moving to Nevada too. So uh, we're, we're going to have a permanent, more, a more permanent base in Nevada because we, we're, we travel, my wife and I travel like a lot of the year and um, we're in France and Germany every spring teaching there. And uh, we're, we're just, we're, we travel a lot. Okay, now uh, from Santa Cruz, what, what uh, was the next step? And what, what did you do in Santa Cruz? Did you? Publishing, book publishing. We, That's when I you had, started publishing, okay. Yeah, started a publishing company. And that company did reasonably well. Uh, we eventually moved it to Lake County, which is about, about 100 miles north of uh, San Francisco and lived there for a few years. Uh, so I, our children were born in California and um, so we, we've been around the Bay Area uh, for a long time now. And when did you, let's see, I, I met you, I think you were in Windsor, weren't you, or somewhere? Yes. Yeah, uh, and I remember my first impression, it was, first of all, you're what I call a normal size human being. <laughs> <laughs> I'm 6'5", and you're what, probably? 6'5". The same height. and. And uh, you got more on your on your frame than I do, and I I remember a first hug with you. It was like, wow, <laughs> this is what it's like. You know, it could be like <laughs> all these midgets that uh, come up to your, you know, they have their face in your chest or something, uh, and just your your overall teddy bearness that uh, um, immediately struck me as uh, a very unusual man, and uh, uh, we. Uh, we connected. I was it's about two thousand eight or nine, somewhere in there, I think. And I wound up house sitting for you, I believe, because I was doing my uh, California escape from Australian winters and uh, didn't have a base in the U.S., so I was hopping around to various places. And then uh, uh, I edited one of your books. It wasn't Genie in the Jeans, though, was it? Which... No, it was an anthology, and I did several of these over that period, like 2000 to 2010, and they were just getting the ideas of, of lead, thought leaders in various topics like aging, like uh, the whole movement toward feminine power, um, peak vitality, not decline, okay. but vitality, so they did a whole bunch of those anthologies. It was the one on power therapies because it was new to me and it, it uh, was a real eye opener. Um, yeah. And um, uh, how'd you run into Bruce Lipton? He wanted to uh, get editing help on the book. He'd been Bruce at that point, this is 2002, 2003. Uh, he'd been popular and inspiring people for 15 years, but no book. And he just had a lot of trouble crystallizing his ideas in a book. Uh-huh. So he had eventually got an editor. I helped him do some editing. He then self-published his first book and I helped him through the, the whole process. Right. And then uh, you referred Pam McDonald to me for her book. And uh, that was a huge task because biochemistry and I are not, uh, <laughs> it was like you and math. <laughs> I had to relearn a lot of biochemistry to, to put that one together. And then I pretty much lost track of you. I saw you were taken off with EFT and uh, uh, I wound up uh, uh, in Marin with Yvonne 2000, well, first in East Bay and um, followed you from afar, but uh, glad I could track you down and and, uh, 
capture some of what uh, what's transpired. Now you have uh, how many kids? That's... I have three kids. So I had two with my ex-wife and then one with someone else. And um, then I, I met, I got divorced a long time ago. And then I, um, I, I met my current wife. And so we've been together for more than a decade. And um, so she's, when I talk to my, my, my wife, she's like my real wife. <laughs> uh -huh. Yeah, about the same time I met Yvonne about 10 years ago. And uh because you were single when, when I was house sitting for you. So tell me about your real wife. She sounds like a pretty important part of your life. We're, we just thought we're very fortunate. And so um, we're in many different ways. And one of them is just love. We just both are incredibly loving people. I know I was in psychotherapy many years ago with, with a girlfriend between my two marriages. And um, the psychotherapist said, you know, Dawson, you've just got to learn to rein in your emotions in this in this relationship. You're you're just too much for most people. And uh, later on, when my my wife and I compared notes, when she she'd also got, gotten divorced earlier and was in psychotherapy, and the psychotherapist had told her almost the same thing. Oh, you know, you're, you're just too you're too much emotionality, too much energy, too much, just too much. And so when you put two people who are too much together and it's not too much in the sense of unregulated energy like i, I say emotional regulation is the fundamental key to happiness if you mm -hmm. regulate your emotions you are likely to be happy highly likely to be happy these tibetan monks who have spent ten thousand hours of meditation the emotional regulation part of the brain is highly developed and when mm -hmm. i say highly developed i mean maybe double the size of the average person, sometimes more. So the ability to regulate your emotions is really important. And when you have two people who are both really loving and intense and they're together, it's it's powerful. So we, we do that. We just are incredibly gushingly loving to each other every day and, and respectful and kind and and just, just really um, milk the relationship for all of the juice mm. it, it has, it's wonderful. How did you meet and where? We met at a church called the Center for Spiritual Living. And I've been involved in New Thought churches, so science of mind, mm -hmm. religion science, unity, all of those for a long time. And it was really, really a karmic meeting. We, I had not been to the church for about five years. And uh, my men's group um, meets at the church. So I think we meet, we meet, we meet off premises, but it, it's, it's, uh, it's, it was founded at the church. And so I went to the church that day to drop off my check for the annual men's group retreat because it was the last day to register. So I just parked outside, ran inside, check in hand, uh, handed it to the men's group leaders there. And um, but then got talking to somebody, got delayed. So this woman, um, began talking to her and while we stood there and at the point we're in the we're in the parking lot actually I think we we're leaving but we're just saying they're, they're talking to this woman Christine and um my ex-wife happened to walk by so she joined the conversation for a few minutes we chatted but the three of us talked for for a little while and then my ex-wife left and then my um oldest son was visiting from university and happened to walk by so he met he met her in the parking lot. My youngest son, whose mom lives in New York State, all the way across the continent, was visiting California. And my youngest son walked by and met her. And then my daughter, who is local, also came. They just all wander, happened to wander by that part of that part of this giant church parking lot at the same <laughs> moment. So it's pretty uh that uh, is quite unusual. Yeah, yeah. And so within a couple of weeks, I just knew I wanted to be with her the rest of my life. And uh, so it's, yeah, wow. a, a good, loving, heartful marriage is, is a wonderful thing. We, have, we actually have a, an online course called Tapping Deep Intimacy. And when you use these tools like EFT, acupressure tapping, we meditate together in the mornings, uh, things like active listening, being respectful, just be fundamental respect for the other person so if you use these tools then you can just build a blow the top of fantastic marriage mm. now was this the church in santa rosa yeah okay well so i i actually had something to do with that men's group um 
at different times. Jerry Cornacchio is a good friend yes. of mine. And yeah, uh, we still uh, are, you know, email a couple times a day and I see him whenever I'm there. So I hadn't realized that connection. But, uh, yeah, I've, I've actually helped him with wiring in that church. So he was the building <laughs> manager. And we were crawling in panels and trying to figure out why something didn't work. But you had that experience in the parking lot. Wow, yep. what a yep. what a story. So um, um, you, you mentioned that you uh, travel all over the world and in, in, in France in particular, and what, uh, say more about your travels. I love teaching. And the crucial thing we have to do now as transformational leaders is have an impact. Uh, there are millions of people who are suffering unnecessarily. And by unnecessary suffering, I mean preventable suffering. And we're at a point in our development as a human species where we have figured out how to eradicate almost all mental illness. And so you look at the research in EMDR, EMDR and EFT, the kind of twin, mm -hmm. uh, twin methods, they both use tapping, they both use eye movements and essentially uh, EFT is take home, is at home EMDR. So people can do it themselves, they can do it alone. With EMDR, we really recommend that you have a therapist. So either of a therapist or alone, you're doing these eye movement, these tapping techniques. And so in my research with veterans, the, the, the cutoff score on the questionnaire that is used by the Veterans Administration, by most uh, hospital systems, cutoff score for PTSD, clinical PTSD, that means severe flashbacks, nightmares, hypervigilance, avoidance, all these symptoms, intrusive thoughts, is 50. The average veteran in my studies is at 64. So they're way above the clinical cutoff. The highest mm. possible score is 80. They're way up there in terms of uh, being, I mean, they're severe impacts. And then those things show up in the form of increased rates of cancer, heart disease, diabetes, suicide attempts, smoking, you name it, they've got more of all the bad stuff. So uh, it's not just psych, you know, some, some, some things like anxiety is psychological. We don't realize how physiological these oh, mental yeah. health conditions are. And PTSD, in fact, the guy who really studied it for the US Army after World War I, a psychiatrist called Abraham Cardiner, he didn't even call it a mental health condition. He called it a physiological neurosis. He said, this is physical, mm -hmm. not this is mental. So um, we take these veterans, they have, there are these high levels of, of scoring high on the charts, PTSD. We give them six one hour sessions. Now that's not much time, just one hour, six weeks in a row. Their average score on that PTSD checklist after that goes from 64 to 34. And when we retest them three and six months later, sometimes a year later, they're still in the mid thirties. In other words, it's a permanent cure for PTSD. That's PTSD in, in depression and anxiety, uh, same thing. The, in meta-analyses of clinical trials, the, so if you look, there's a very important number in, in psychology called Cohen's difference or D. And if you have a D of two, that means you have an effective treatment. Your treatment has a measurable effect on patient well-being. Mm -hmm. You have a D of five. A D of five means that you have a moderately effective treatment. So minimally effective treatment, two, moderately five, eight is a highly effective treatment. So that's the spectrum on which we evaluate. You know, mm -hmm. you have to go for a treatment. Is it a two, a five, or an eight? The number for anxiety for EFT is 12. The number for depression is 13. The number for PTSD is 29. <laughs> we have wow. treatments now for PTSD, depression, and anxiety that in, in very minimal numbers of sessions is able to, it just wipes them out. So we now have the tools as surely as we had the tools we had a century ago to abolish. I mean, we essentially disimagine typhoid, cholera, dysentery, all of those things in a 10 year period, roughly between 1915 and 1925. Before in 1915, 1916, um, typhoid was killing more, it was more lethal to be a child in New York City 
than to be a soldier on the front lines of World War I in France. It was that killing that many kids. And it was just gone in 1925. I mean, we, we just nailed it as a society. Now, we haven't realized it. We have those same tools to nail virtually all mental health conditions. And so by, you know, by, um, by 2050, these things will be as mysterious to the average person. You know, I say, I say cholera or I say typhoid. No one knows what those things are. But, you know, our grandparents knew what they were. They knew people who died of them. By 2050, mm -hmm. our kids won't mm -hmm. know what depression, anxiety, and people will hardly even know anybody who knows anybody with PTSD or depression or anxiety. We're that, that, that cusp of mental health now we were with physical health a century ago. And then, and then, and why I'm saying this is that it, uh, our, our, this, the trajectory of eliminating that suffering depends on the influence that people like you and me have, Bruce Lipton and... And you know, they're, they're, they're all, all these people that are um, focused on getting the word out there. And so we have these tools to eradicate human suffering now. And that's what motivates me is to see these kinds of techniques get into widespread adoption in primary care. And given the, the current situation for viewers that may not be aware uh, historically, we've just finished a year of lockdowns and the COVID pandemic, uh, which has created an enormous amount of psychological stress as well as physical stress, much of which I believe was unnecessary, that the, uh, the whole overreaction uh, is not based on science. That's another whole thing. And now we're being um, assailed with a vaccine that's supposed to fix everything, which it's in, in research doesn't really hold that much promise, but uh, the media are are uh, turning it into, I, I call it vaccinemania. Uh, so given the stresses that you're seeing, um, or are you seeing them? I, I, I am in terms of personally with myself, with friends. Um, it's been a, a pretty wild year. What's your take on, on that and uh, what the outcome's gonna be? I was listening to a friend of mine, a doctor friend of mine, talk about um, privilege. And she was talking especially about white privilege. And um, I was thinking that the real privilege isn't racial. The real privilege is consciousness. And there's a, such a divide between people I talk to. When I talk to a, another meditation master, for example, no, none of those meditation masters I, I know and I've talked to recently or, or, or I know well, none of them had a bad year that year. They, they were as happy uh, as they were the year before and they are the year after. And so the divide, the privilege is those people who have claimed their potential, who are able to move into these elevated states and the people who imagine that they're, they're sick and suffering and doomed. And it has nothing to do with economics either. There are people who are poor. I mean, these Tibetan monks we study, these 10,000 hour meditators, they, they have nothing. They don't own a single thing. They don't own a home. They have no retirement plan, and yet they're in absolute bliss. Now, these Franciscan nuns, same thing. You know, they've spent 20 years chanting and praying, and they're just in absolute ecstasy. And it's not situational. Some of those people were tortured or persecuted, and they often did not have very easy lives, and yet they've moved into this state. Uh, so some uh, people are very poor and very happy. Some people are very rich and very unhappy. I know several people who are extremely wealthy and are just racked with various mm -hmm. kinds of um, worries that take away their peace of mind. So that the real criterion is consciousness. Uh, that's, the, that's the real privilege. And it's a privilege you give yourself. No one can tap you on the forehead and say, oh, now you get to be happy the rest of your life. Um, you, but you get to tap yourself in the, in, in the mind, first of all. And then the other thing in my book, This Brain, with astonishing speed, your brain remodels, remodels itself. And one of the case histories I have in my books is a man called Graham Phillips, who was a TV journalist and decided to learn meditation. He was kind of an irritable guy, a fast-paced, hard-driving guy. And he said, well, I'm a TV journalist. I want to learn meditation. So we'll do a whole documentary on my meditation journey. And he took his crew with him into a university lab where the, 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 the lab directors there worked on measuring all his hormones and neurotransmitters and uh, 
his body has physical reactions, his psychology, but with a high resolution MRI, they down to the last neuron mapped his brain and how much volume there was in each region of his brain. He then began to meditate, then began to become mindful, spent eight weeks doing this. And in eight weeks, he went back in the lab, they measured his brain again, and several regions had grown by two to 5% in only eight weeks. Now think about that, two to 5% brain growth in two mm. months. I mean, that's, that's what can happen. One part of his brain, and this is the part that actually coordinates emotional regulation brain-wide. It's a little tiny sliver of tissue about the size of my fingernail here in the center of your brain, middle of your hippocampus called the dentate gyrus. In eight weeks, this man's name is Graham Phillips. In eight weeks, Graham Phillips's dentate gyrus had grown by 22.8%. That's mm. how quickly we can remodel our brains with our minds. This purely mental is doing this in eight weeks, two months, is a 22.8% growth in the part of the brain that governs emotional regulation, which I mentioned earlier, emotional regulation is key to happiness. So people are getting dramatically happier and then it's not a state, it becomes a trait. And so that's the promise. That's why I say it's really important to share this with people. When we're in these elevated states, when those meditation masters are feeling so good, their brains are running information differently and remodeling quickly. And then, you know, all kinds of bad things happen around us, but um, we are stable. One story about, the, about this, about, about a monk who came to the Dalai Lama after he'd escaped from Lhasa. And it was, it's a long way, it's a thousand miles to Dar Dharamsala in India, where the Dar Dalai Lama is from Lhasa. And the monastery had been destroyed by Chinese troops. And some of the monks had been tortured, they'd all been expelled. And so the Dalai Lama heard his story and he, he asked, just curious, he said to the monk, what was the moment of greatest danger in your journey? And the monk said, monk held up his hand and his little finger was there, his thumb was there, and all these three fingers were missing. And he'd been tortured by the Chinese soldiers and they'd cut off his fingers one by one. And the monk said, my moment of greatest danger on the journey, when he cut off my first finger, I thought, what is it like to be a Chinese soldier cutting off the finger of a Tibetan monk? But when he cut off my second finger, I almost, I almost lost my compassion for him. That was my moment of greatest danger. So these people mm. who are this happy, who are this emotional regulation, who are this loving, who are this much gratitude, they didn't have perfect lives. I haven't had a perfect life. <laughs> Things go wrong. Things don't work out all, all the time. But, um, you know, we're just fundamentally dispositioned to be happy. We have, we, have, we have happy brains. We've changed our minds. So there's a big divide. There's a big disparity now. The, that's the privilege. Have you applied your mind rigorously to being in that high state, being in that loving, grateful state every day? If you do, and if you have, you begin to change your brain really quickly in eight weeks. In eight months, in eight years, you have a fundamentally different brain inside your skull, and then you have a dramatically happier life. So pandemic, economic ups and downs, political upheaval, there's always going to be stuff going on in the outside world. But your inner world can be what a complete equilibrium, regardless of all that stuff out there. And there's a lot of people that have lost their businesses or lost their jobs that probably aren't aware of any of um, the consciousness <clears throat> technology. So uh, reaching them is going to be a big challenge because the, uh, the audience has gotten a lot bigger very quickly, I think. Yeah, well, so. I in my book, so Genie and Your Genes was my first big bestseller. In 2018, I wrote a book called Mind to Matter. I, I was published that year. It was written over the previous two years, but it was all about, it's all about the link between thoughts and things. It just traces step mm -hmm. by step all the scientific evidence between the, the process of us having a thought or a belief or an idea, an inner reality, and that becoming a material reality in the outside world. There's just a, an amazing amount of science around this. And then the book I wrote in 2018 is called Bliss Brain. It's all about hitting these extraordinary 
states of of bliss that you do in mm -hmm. meditation. And so I wrote that book in 2018. And in, uh, in October 2017, uh, one night, October 9th, my wife shook me awake and I looked out the window. She said something's really wrong. And I looked, at, looked next to my bed at the alarm clock that said 12.45 a.m. Looked out the window, there was a glow on the horizon. I walked outside and there was a wildfire sweeping down the valley toward our house. And we literally, I, I yelled at her, we're getting out of here right now. We literally sprinted through the house, grabbed the car keys, ran out to the car through a, just a, a storm of embers. Just the, the whole world was crazy. It was like a snowstorm of these glowing embers. And as we, we drove, away at high speed, the trees were exploding in flames around us. And um, we, we just got out. I, I didn't see any cars getting out of our, our road uh, after our, uh, I think one car got out after us, but, um, but it was a devastating wildfire. It destroyed 5,400 homes in Santa Rosa that night. And destroyed, we had our office building on our property, destroyed the office, destroyed the house, destroyed the outbuildings, uh, and literally, we then didn't have a home. And so we spent, you know, we spent the next few days just trying to figure out where do we get clothes and food and where do we stay and mm. basic needs like that. And um, so uh, that, was the, the, that was the beginning of a very difficult couple of years. 2018 was not easy. 2019 was not, not very easy for us. We also, with our business being physically planned, being destroyed, a lot of our business was affected and we went, we, we drew down all of our savings. We eventually had zero savings. We had two retirement funds accounts. We had to draw down one retirement fund to zero. And then we had to draw down the other one to zero. And at the end of the, that year, we were $300,000 in debt. So we not, not only had nothing, we had, you know, we lost our home and our office and all our possessions, every single thing. Wow. And now we lost all our money, all our, I mean, every single dollar of retirement savings on one dollar left. Um, and then this huge amount of debt. And so that's where we found ourselves. And I had to have an operation for a hernia I acquired when I was carrying, lugging around big things, heavy things after the fire. So was that a good year? Well, I meditated every morning. I'd write in my journal how blessed and lucky and grateful I was. And I wrote the book, Bliss Brain. <laughs> and that's just how it wow. is, Jack. You know, you, you wow. just get to the point where you are, you are not situationally happy. You have a resilient brain. You have that dentate gyrus well-developed. You have, your amygdala begins to shrink and it actually, actually atrophies in time. And so mm -hmm. these stress structures in the brain just start to not be used anymore. And you have a fire, you lose everything, lose all your money, you have to have an operation. Uh, I mean, m many people would say, well, that's pretty bad. You know, that, that sucks. And on one level, level it does, on another level, you just tune into the universe every morning meditation and you are in touch with a source of so much love. I mean, I, look, I cry when sometimes when I'm meditating because I, I don't know what to do with all of the love I'm feeling from the, the infinite at those times. So that's, that's the reality. And then, you know, the pandemic comes along or <laughs> the financial crash. And, you know, when you've had your house burned down around you and all those things happen and you're still in bliss, it's like that, that's your anchor there. And, and those ups and downs of the world, that turmoil doesn't have a effect on you. Wow. It's a great uh, testimony to the effectiveness of your your approach. <laughs> now, um, before we started the recording, you mentioned something about 4,000 years history of wellness. And I'm curious uh, to explore what you were thinking with that. Well, we have networks in our brains. And in, in this brain, I explain what they are. And so, uh, we have this very well-developed network for identifying and responding to threats and opportunities. And so one, one neuroscientist said that 70% of all the mass in the brain is in some way there to detect and respond to threats. 
And so we have all of these ability, all these networks, all these parts of our mm -hmm. brains that respond directly to threats, but also we have the default mode network, and which is a really interesting network. And in uh, in the default mode network has two nodes, the mid prefrontal cortex over here, right between our eyebrows, and then the, the, the uh, posterior cingulate cortex, the back of our head, and the pecunius that uh, kind of function as a unit back there. So these two regions in our brain of the default mode network. And when we are doing something, when we are do, driving a car or making dinner or having a conversation or uh, composing an email, when we're just sitting in our brains idling, that every bit of spare capacity we have is grabbed by the default mode network. And the default, that's why it's called the default mode network. Our brain defaults there whenever there's available oxygen and nutrients and glucose and all those things, it, it defaults to firing up the default mode network. And the default mode network constructs our sense of self. I am a man. My name is Dawson Church. Uh, I'm wearing a purple shirt. So, I mean, it also is, is me mm -hmm. built by the default mode network. And that's where the brain goes. And the default mode network is very focused on two things. One of those is ruminating about the bad things of our past. What the, what fire almost burned me up in 2017? What uh, what did someone say to me when I was five that hurt me so badly? So the default mode network, it defaults to thinking about the self and especially threats to yourself in the, in the past and then projecting those into the future. Well, you know, that person might say that to me again, so I better uh, preemptively make sure I don't have that, that, that experience. I, I better carry a lot of fire insurance now for the future. Maybe I should move from California. In fact, half my friends have actually moved from California since the fire. So um, mm -hmm. that's the default mode network projecting the past and the dangers of the past into the future, which was totally wonderful and fine and perfect for my ancestors 400,000 years ago because they needed to remember the tiger that almost ate them yesterday and avoid the tiger that might eat them tomorrow. And it made absolute sense for the brain to default to rumination about the bad past and projection about the possibly bad future. But the trouble is that we have no more tigers. And so here we are, modern human beings, and we're consumed by worry and fear and regret and all of these other negative emotions in the absence of any real threats to our survival most of the time. If there's a real fire, believe me, you'll grab your car keys and run that even if you have a sh shrunken, a shriveled amygdala, you will still pick up your car keys and run. So um, that's adaptive for our ancestors along the evolutionary pathway. And it was adaptive for them 400,000 years ago. And then they passed the genes that turned on cortisol, that turned on the stress response fastest to their children, and they passed to their children's children. So we perfected this way of thinking and being over the last you know, half million million years. And now it's it's wrecking our health. High cortisol means loss of bone density, loss of muscle mass, loss of hippocampal mass, loss of the, the, the brains of people who are traumatized as children are 8% smaller than those who weren't traumatized as children. Uh, trauma leads to early death. And we don't know how much earlier it is, but just one study of optimists versus pessimists. Now, these are not traumatized people. These are just moderately gloomy people versus moderately hopeful people, optimists versus pessimists. The optimists lived, this is a, this is a giant 30-year study, and the optimists lived 10 years longer than the pessimists. I mean, mm. the differences are not slight. It's affecting our body all the time. So you want to be one of those people who's using your brain and using your mind and then shifting all of this in that positive direction, and then giving yourself a much healthier, happy life. So really, that's that's the big change that I know I, I've made in my life from being that gloomy, suicidal 13-year-old to being this guy who just is crying with happiness every morning as he merges with the universe, and you can burn my house down and take all my money. And you know, there's one image that I uh, I put in my book, This Brain, of uh, when we got photographs back from a friend of ours who uh, snuck in past the National Guard and photographed the property. We saw the photographs for the first time two days after the fire. And there was just a 
concrete slab with ash on top of it and a chimney sticking out where the house had been. It had melted the washing machine, melted the fridge, melted everything metal. The cars, the wheels had melted, the gloss had melted, the fire got over 2000 degrees, degrees Fahrenheit. And, um, but the office was melted, everything, the computers melted. You couldn't tell where the metal desks had been. They were just pools of molten metal on the ground. And yet there was one thing left in the office sitting there in the middle of the ashes that hadn't burned. And that was a ceramic Buddha that somebody uh -huh. had about this high, somebody had stuffed this Buddha in the back of a closet about 10 years before. And we'd all forgotten about the Buddha. Someone piled some files in front of the Buddha, someone piled some papers on top of the Buddha. The Buddha had been there in the closet for 10 years, forgotten. And then the fire came and burned everything else up. And there's the Buddha sitting there serene in the ashes and i thought mm. that's the metaphor for me of life mm -hmm. you can be that serene buddha in the ashes everything can burn around you can compassion burn fire can't touch it can love burn you can lose all your money and you don't have to lose one single little tiny iota of love so gratitude joy all these things i mean even just cr dial them up to the positive emotion is crank it up to the maximum and live that kind of inspired life. And then again, you will live a much longer life as well as a much healthier life. Hmm. What an image. And I realized, I thought you said 4,000 years, you said 400,000 years. So uh, just to clarify <laughs> the timeline. Wow, what a story. Um, as, as we wrap up, what, uh, what would your final words of wisdom be to uh, hopefully generations down the line that will be watching this, uh, maybe after we're gone? Um, any uh, things that we've missed or uh, final uh, thoughts? The world is heading in an overwhelmingly positive direction. And you wouldn't guess that reading the news. Um, nope. that there are positive news sites too. And I really recommend that for every minute you spend reading any news site, it's going to aggregate bad news and feed it up to you because that's what engages that brain mm -hmm. threat detection system and grabs your eyeballs, and grabs your advertising dollars. Uh, if you go to positive news sites, you will find all kinds of positive things going on. You'll find those things going on in the poorest countries in the world and the richest countries in the world. And the last chapter of Bliss Brain zooms out to 30,000 feet and says, this is what's going on. This is the trend line of science in the last couple of centuries. The average human being today has a lifespan twice as long as my great grandparents a century ago. So lifespan has doubled in a century. Um, disease burden has dropped in most parts of the world. Look, look, look at the figures for infant mortality. They've dropped dramatically in the last 70 years. Human rights, since World War II, they have been jerky and it hasn't been a smooth trajectory, but generally speaking, they've been, been improving all over the world. Female literacy has been improving. So when you get past the, um, the short-term news cycle and look at the long-term studies, we're using half as much carbon per person as we were in 1990 in the advanced economies. Uh, carbon, I mean, obviously we, clearly we, have, we have to solve the climate change problem. How do we do it? Well, there are giant, there are giant factories operating right now and they have huge intake scoops, the scooping in air and they're sucking carbon out of the air. And this is not a science fiction dream or something on the drawing boards. They are in operation right now and they're profitable at about $200 per ton of carbon. There's the Trillion Tree Project, which has been endorsed by, um, uh, by the UN, and it's going to become an X prize as well. Donald Trump, bless his soul, near the end of his, his, his disastrous presidency, actually approved the Trillion Tree Project and, and the US participation in this. And the, the idea is that um, we have about two trillion trees on Earth. If we had a trillion more trees, we would very quickly bring carbon levels down to pre-industrial revolution uh, uh, levels. And we can do it. We can plant native trees. There are tree planting drones that can plant tens of thousands of trees, native trees suited to that climate a day. So um, we are tackling- Did you say drones that can plant drones. trees? Drones, the tree, tree planting plants. They have a little plug of dirt. They have a seed. 
and a little nutrient pack, and they literally fire this into the ground where it plants the uh, plants, wow. the, plants the trees. So the Trillion Tree Project is gaining traction and gaining momentum. And so if you look at the big problems we have right now, cleaning up the oceans, limiting overfishing, I mean, if you, if you zoom out and look at the big picture, human well-being is on an uh, improving trajectory. Human consciousness is on an upward trajectory as well, despite all, all the stuff you read and hear and see. So that's my closing uh, yeah. thought. The science tells us, and again, that's the whole last chapter of this brain, and a new book I'm working on um, is if you look at it, not if you mesmerized by the new cycle, doom and gloom. If you back out and read the science, we're on this improving mm -hmm. cycle of human well being that will continue, including the mental health cycle of eradicating most mental health conditions in the next few years, as I mentioned earlier. Wow. Thank you. What a great ending. And uh, I'm going to end the recording now to. Uh... Uh, but I sure appreciate our getting back together and documenting this. So thank you again. Yeah, who else, who will else?